Okay, good deal. We're talking about that. Today is, uh, we're going to be talking about friendship. And let me tell you a little funny story. Might as well tell you because you're going to hear about one day. Uh, I went home Tuesday afternoon around 4.30, and I, I knew I wasn't feeling well, and I had like a 102-degree uh, fever and uh, had a little bit of a sinus and respiratory infection. And uh, my wife texted me and said, uh, this is what I thought I read. Uh, she had been texting me, asking me how I was, and, and, and uh, she finally said, well, I'll talk with you later. And I said, okay, sweetie, you know that uh, I love you, and I'll be dreaming about you all the way home. The problem was is I did not send that text to my wife. I sent that to Kip, who's here with us today. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So he sent me a text back. I didn't even realize this later on. He sent me a text back and said, I love you too, sweetie, but we're not that close yet, are we? And uh, so um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, purchasing a, a vehicle because uh, my car that I love dearly uh, somehow got four quarts low on oil and some idiot didn't check it. That idiot would be me. And uh, Carmack said they would buy it. And I said, you can have it. Uh, so uh, so I'm looking, and, and so he was texting me, he said, look, we'll get everything took care of later. But it was so, I was so embarrassed when I found out. Uh, isn't it great to know that when we talk about friendship, though, uh, that we can have that type of friend, that we can gain friends. You know, I didn't know Kip up until two years ago. This isn't just a, uh, a man that, that I'm working with on a truck deal. This is also Hannah Slagle's father. And uh, we've gotten to know each other. And you need to know, when my boy first met you, he was terrified. He's like, Daddy, he's so big and mean looking. He would kill me. And I said, never forget that, son. <laughs> never forget that. And uh, now he, he talks about Kip. He's just such a great guy. And, um, but we can gain friends along the way. Friends that we, lie, uh, we, we, uh, we laugh with. Uh, friends that we journey with. Friends that we face obstacles with. Um, this morning, uh, before I get started, I actually have a, a brief video that's about two men. They've been friends since elementary school, and one of them's facing a very difficult challenge in his life. But actually, I think they're making a documentary on this friendship. But I think it really entails a lot about what I'm going to be sharing with you in the Scripture Day in Mark 2. So with that being said, if you'll please uh, play that. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk with you about what it means to have friendship, what it means to be friends, what it means uh, to walk and journey with others. And I believe our text says a lot about our text we're looking at. If you'll turn your Bibles to Mark 2, uh, Mark 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Now, there's more to the story after, after uh, verse 5, and we're going to talk about that next week. But this week, we're going to focus on these men. Uh, Jesus is back, and, um, and he is sharing, and, and we find him in a house, and it's, it's, just, it's just crowded to the max. Now, this is a familiar text to many of us. It's one I've not preached on since I've been here, uh, but I wanted to touch on it today because I, I think we can get a lot of illustration as to what friendship is and looks like. Let's read our text. Mark 2, 1 through 5. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. This is what Jesus did. He came to preach the word. And they came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And then they had made an opening let... And they let him down. Amen. And they, and they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Father, we do love you. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to hear your word. Lord, don't let me mess it up. I, Lord, everybody in this room knows I'm more than well uh, have the ability to do that. So God, you just speak up and do what you need to do. Lord, I just want to be a broken vessel restored only through the power of the Holy Spirit to preach and share your word. Lord, I pray today we would understand what friendship is. Lord, not with just each other, but God, understanding the desire of friendship that you have with us. So bless this time and let us leave as your friend, your child, and the one you love. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. So, 
the interesting thing here is when we talk about friends, you know, a lot of people say that friends and friends. This is my friend. But you know, we use the word friend a lot like we use the word love, and we use it in a very flippant way in today's culture. It doesn't really mean we love things or we're friends with things. I've always tried to be very careful with the way I use friend. If you need to know something, if I was to ever tell someone you're my friend, I, I really take that literally. I don't just say that. I've had people come up before and, and they said, Brad, do you know this person? I said, I know of this person. Then they're my acquaintance and we're in the same circles. So they're your friend. I said, well, I wouldn't go that far. You know, I learned a long time ago, there's a difference between saying you know somebody and they're your friend. But in our text today, we're going to learn what does friendship look like? What are some of the characteristics of friendship? And I, and I hope that when people look at you and the friendship that they have with you, I pray uh, that this is what they see in your life. And I pray this is the way you see Jesus and the Lord in your life. The first thing we see is that friendship understands our conditions. Friendship understands our condition. They're around us. They know what we're going through. They know what we're dealing with. It says in verse 3, And they came bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. Now what's interesting in this text, their names are never mentioned. No name is ever mentioned of the paralytic or the four men. But we see the condition of the man. These four men see the condition of him. They see that their friend, he's, he, has, he has a physical uh, inability in his life. He was desperate in need of help, but no one could fix him. As a matter of fact, he was 100% unable to do anything to make something happen without these men. He, there's no way he could ever get to Jesus. There's no way he could ever do what needed to be done to get the help that he needed all on his own. He said, Pastor, what's that look like to us? Well, we're the same way, folks. Our inability is sin. Now, you can call the sin what you want. There's a lot of sins out there. But sin is what hinders us from getting and obtaining what we need. And we can't get there. We can't get to what we need if we try to do it on our own. And people try to do it all the time. They, they say, well, you know, if I could get the next house or if I could get the next car, if, if I could just get my family right, if I could just get everything the way it needs to be. And look, we try that so often. And it seems like the minute we get everything the way it needs to be, it begins to crumble. Why? Because sin is present in our life and it's always going to be there to destruct and destroy our efforts. But yet we live in a world that says, especially this humanistic view, you, you, you can, your, your help comes from you. You fix yourself from the inside out. Inner strength will get you there. I'm 47 now. My inner strength sometimes isn't as strong as it used to be. But I know one thing. We can't do it without Jesus. And Jesus knows our condition. A very familiar text. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a person in this room that ain't messed up. Matter of fact, if you say, well, I don't have sin in my life, uh, God calls you a liar. That's what the word says. It says you're a liar or you're calling God one. We're all messed up. They ain't a half sane person in the bunch, really. I don't know how most of us make it to a ripe old age. There's been people, I've actually done funerals for people. I'm like, folks, the most impressive thing about this person's life is they lived this long. Because I knew them, they were crazy. They, did, they, did, they didn't do crazy things, they did dumb things. You know, where I'm from in the South, you know, the old saying, hey, watch this. I'm like, well, I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna laugh when you get hurt. And they did. The problem is, is I said that a few times myself. You have to. I don't want to, it ain't, it ain't time to testify though. But here's the thing, he knows our condition. You see, our sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, but your iniquities, your sins have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin separates our relationship. You ever been in a relationship that you desired with all your heart, but it just wasn't working out? You wanted it to work out. You wanted it to be just right. You wanted it to be just perfect. But it just didn't seem to function. That's what sin does. It gets in there. As a matter of fact, it, um, it messes our relationships up so much that 
We can't even, even though we want to be around someone, we can't hardly stand to be around them because all we do is fuss and argue and fight. But God knows our condition. Ephesians 2, 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. I, I guess what I want to finish up with in this part of the sermon is God knows your condition. You may hide it from me. You may hide it from others. You may hide it from the friend that brought you today or invited you today. You may hide it from your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, your co-workers or those at school. But I just want you to know, not as condemnation, but as encouragement. God knows your condition. God knows what you're dealing with. And because of that, because God knows your condition, he also understands the obstacles you face. You see, friendships overcome obstacles. Within a relationship, there will always be obstacles. You ever had a relationship that went perfect all the time? I love it when, when people, we've been married 50 years and we never fought the first time. I'm like, well, I've been married a little over 25. We can teach you how. I love my wife. I tell you right now, but she, she, she is, a, she is a, 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 a very strong-willed person. And I tell her, yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to say stubborn. I wasn't. Y'all were thinking it, but I didn't say it. But, but we'll argue, and I'm like, if you would just listen to what I'm saying, everything would be fine. You know, and that's usually when we don't talk for a little while. Um, <laughs> there's going to be obstacles in relationships and there were some obstacles here let's read what it says in verse 4 and when they could not get near him because of the crowd they moved the roof above him and when they made an opening they let the bed down on which the paralytic lay so what obstacles did these men face first of all there was no room there was no room for anyone else we ever feel that way those people don't have time for me my family, my friends, they don't have time for me. God doesn't have time for me. There's no room. There's no access. And even if I did have room, there's no way to get there. There's no way I could get there. And there's no path. Even if the door was open, I wouldn't know how to get there. That's, no doubt that's what these men had felt when they first got there. How, how are we going to get there? But here they are. You've got these four men. They're, they're, they're paralytic friend. They, just, they know if they can get him to the help that he needs. They know that Jesus can fix the problem. But the, the obstacle now is, is that there's no way to get him there. So they thought. You see, when we come and understand that our friends need our help, that's what friendship does. It helps overcome obstacles. I've got friends when I wanted to be hopeless. You ever just wanted to have a pity party? on yourself and you got that one friend he's trying to cheer you up and or she's trying to cheer you up and you get aggravated with them because you don't want to be cheered up I don't want to be cheered up I'm sure I don't want to have a pity party because no one loves me I love you you're the only one that does and I don't know why you love me you ever had that conversation <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand but I believe you <laughs> something to buy right here <laughs> wake up uh, uh, the old the old joke uh a church member got up one day and said, I don't want to go to that church today. Nobody likes me there. You got to get up, sweetie. You got to go. Nobody wants me there. You got to get up. Well, when do I got to go? Well, first of all, you're the pastor. <laughs> Here's the thing. We all have those obstacles in our life. But yet these men, though they saw obstacles, they saw a way. You see, the room, no room simply meant they had to find some. You know what? There was plenty of room on the roof. And because there was no access, that simply meant they had to make some. So what did they do? They, they, for free, they gave this person's house a skylight. Wasn't that nice of them? And you say, you say well, there was no way to get to it. Well, not by land, but by air. This may be the first recorded airlift known to mankind. You see, you see, when we face obstacles in life, if we're not careful, we're constantly letting them beat us, beat them, beat us down. But real friends, when we have, now this is friendship. Not people that say they're your friend, but they're not there when the obstacle comes. You've had those in your life. Man, they're your friend as long as everything's going good. But boy, you let your life get so bad, you can't get above the dirt line. And you don't see nobody there. But then again, there's some friends that are always there and they're like, look, I don't care how bad it gets. 
how bad you feel. My buddy Brad Atkins, one time he had a brain tumor in his head. I had a lot going on at my church. I, I, didn't, have time, I didn't have time to get away. I didn't have time for Brad Atkins. Y'all know him. He's my best friend. But his wife called and said, Brad's in the hospital. They found a brain tumor. He's going to be here for a little while. We don't know what to do. I called my chairman Deacons. I called my wife. I'll be in and out. Y'all going to have to deal without me for a little while. If you can't handle it and if it costs me my job, that's fine. And I stopped everything in my life and I sat at that bedside for days. Because friends are there when you think no one ever would be. And I cry with him. He, he doesn't even know most of it. He doesn't remember most of it. But I'd sit there and read scripture to him. And, I'd, and yes, we were, we're men. But I held his hand and I wept and I just prayed and cried for him. Because that's my best friend. Folks, that's what Jesus is to us as well. You see, God understood this one thing. Something had to happen. Obstacles were not an option. Obstacles were not an option. And when God looked at you and God looked at me, he said, I want a relationship. I, I want a relationship with Ira. I want a relationship with Jennifer. I want a relationship with Joe. But when God wanted a relationship, he looked at them and looked at me and looked at you. And he said, but there's sin. I can't touch sin. I can't be around sin. And God said, oh, well. No. Sin and the obstacle of sin wasn't an option. So he gave us Jesus. He said, I'm going to overcome this. God sent his son Jesus to overcome our sin. No matter the sin. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us Christ died for us you see my friends I, I don't know your sin today I sat in a man's office the other day at, a, at another dealership another one not yours I'm like, Kip, this is not Kip and he shut both the doors and he said we don't know each other that well but I feel I could talk to you. And I said, okay. He said, I'm losing everything. He said, I'm drinking a lot. And all me and my wife do, my family do, is argue. And I feel everything slipping away. How could God love me? And I said, God will love you more now than he ever has because you're acknowledging that you need him. And we talked for two hours. I don't know your sin. I don't know what you're dealing with. Maybe it's loneliness, but he'll be your companion. Maybe it's brokenness, but God will heal your heart. Folks, maybe it's just a hopelessness. And God will restore that through Jesus. He'll, he'll take care of you. Oh, preacher, that's what you're supposed to say because you're the pastor. Folks, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be a pastor anymore. I, I don't get up here and, and, and give speeches and try to make you and me feel good about ourselves and get a paycheck and go home. Uh, look, there's, a, there's easier jobs. I, I preach it because Jesus restored my hope. He, he's forgiven me of my sin. I walk in victory, not in mine, but in his. I'm telling you, friendship overcomes obstacles. And I don't know the sin that you're dealing with today. I don't know if you're saved or not. You may be saved and you say, but pastor, I know that I've got Jesus Christ in my life, but I am struggling. I've got sin. I've let it creep in the back door and it's ripping my heart apart. Have you been there? You're this close to losing your mind. And losing your hope and it's all you can do to keep it together I'm telling my friends what sin is destroying God can restore he understands your condition he understands your obstacle because Christ and God understand your need friendships meet needs this man had a need that only Jesus could meet but you know what's really interesting Here's what I find interesting. He's a paralytic. 
most of us and the people that day said, well, naturally, they, they lower this man down and everybody's looking and, and they're like, well, he wants to be physically healed. This is what he wants. He wants his life right. He wants everything to be as it should be. And yet when Jesus looks down and he sees the faith of these men and sees the faith of this paralytic, what does he do? He says, your faith has made your whole, your, your sins are forgiven. Well, that's nice and all. We're going to talk about this next week. Well, God, that's nice and all. Some of them didn't think he had the right to do that. But why, why are you forgiving the sins? He needs to walk. But when Jesus, let me tell you something. See, Jesus can peer into the part of your heart that no one else can. And the truth is, most people want to be right with God. They want to know that everything is at peace. We can suffer so much in this life as long as we know that things are right between me and God. And when Jesus looked down at this man and this paralytic looked up at him and Jesus peered into his heart, what he saw that this paralytic man desired most of all with his faith was to be right with Jesus. Simply to be made right. I put it this way. When all is said and done, the biggest need is simply to come to Jesus. Don't you love it when people give you their opinion? Don't you love that? I had something the other day. I said, tell me what you think about that. And they told me everything except what I asked for. And then have you ever met those that you don't have to ask? Ain't they a blessing? They just feel that they have the right to tell you everything you've done wrong. Don't you just love to sit down with people like that? Well, you just need to get your family right. You just need to get your relationships right with your kids. If you just got things right with your husband or your wife, or if you just got things right with work, folks, all that boils down to this. If you get things right with Jesus, all that takes care of itself. When you're having problems at home, when you're having problems at work, when you're having problems at school, when you're having problems wherever you may be, the truth is, it's not that, that that's just the symptom. The problem is, is you've got issues with Jesus. You see, you've got to come to Jesus with faith. Faith is not compromised. I put it this way. Faith does not come with conditions and restraints. It comes with complete surrender. Faith means it's yours. The great, you say, Pastor, I wish I had a friend like Brad Atkins or David Bagwell or David Shirley. These are other very close friends of mine. I, I wish I had a friend like Kevin Evans. I, I wish I had friends like you have. Do you know how I've gotten close to these men? And they've gotten close to me? Here's my friendship. You're going to know all about me. Pastor, I wish I could, I could walk with God like I see so many other men and women do. How do they do that? Complete surrender. This man came to Jesus. He had nothing to offer than to say, I give everything to you. When Jesus looked into his heart, he accepted that faith. Friendship is surrendering. To your friends and when you do they understand your condition they know your obstacles and they'll meet your needs maybe this morning if you don't know Jesus Christ maybe may I'd love to talk to you maybe the first thing you need to do is is, is just have enough faith to say God I surrender it all go ahead and pull this up have you placed your faith have you surrendered everything to Jesus now have it look now have you got dunked in the pool and you said, you know, Pastor, I said a prayer and I got dunked and my life never really changed all that much. Did you surrender? You've got to surrender. And it's Jesus, the friend of your heart. Maybe you know you're walking with the Lord, but you let some things slip in. Hey, you don't have to come to me. Maybe you just need to come to the altar and get down on your hands and knees. I got to get down on my hands and knees? Yeah. When's the last time you humbled yourself before God? 
I'm myself for nobody. Well, then just mosey on out the way you walked in. How's that been doing for you? I'm not just being honest. How's that working? Just let it go. Whatever is keeping you from being a friend with the Lord and being the true friend to others, could you let it go? Let's go, Lord, in prayer.